Welcome to Biology Minds. Today we're going to talk about forensic entomology. In forensics, we're going to use different types of insects in order to create a timeline or uh, to understand exactly what happened after death. So you're going to hear over and over again in forensic science how we're always trying to create a timeline to reconstruct the crime scene in order to kind of get a general idea or more than general idea of what happened, wh when did it happen, who, what, when, where, why, how everything happened. So you're going to create a timeline and entomologists are, they study insects and they're going to be experts in telling us the life cycle of different species of insects and how we can use these insects in order to create that timeline to understand what happened uh, after death. So forensic entomologists, they're experts and they are going to combine both uh, the science of the insects along with uh, trying to contribute contribute uh, to the law enforcement investigation aspect of having these insects on a corpse. So insects that are part of the Colliferoridae family of the Diptera order of the insect insecta class in the animal kingdom, these are a major part of looking at forensic entomology and creating a timeline. So uh, one specific species that we are going to look at are blowflies. Okay, sometimes you're going to hear about green flies, and they're the first to arrive, and they're helpful in estimating time of death, specifically when death was, was rather recent. Okay, they're going to lay their eggs in orif orifices to uh, keep them moist, protected, and warm. You're going to see that they're going to uh, try to lay their eggs uh, maybe in the mouth, maybe near the anus, genital regions, in the armpits, anywhere that's going to be moist. It's going to be protected from the elements, rain, snow, sleet, whatever it may be. And it's going to try to keep them warm. So the eggs are laid there. It's going to be a good area for those legs to, for those eggs to, to stay warm and protected and moist. And also once they do hatch into larvae, then they are able to eat something. So the larvae hatch, a lot of times you're going to hear people talk about maggots. All right, those are the larvae. All right, they hatch and they start feeding on the corpse. Eventually, the feeding frenzy of not only the blowfly larvae, um, but also other insects as well, they can increase the temperature of the corpse more than 10 degrees Celsius. So while the, the corpse is decreasing in temperature because after you die, there's no more metabolism, there's no more chem, uh, chemical reactions really going on within that, you're not maintaining homeostasis in, as a multicellular organism, but once these uh, insects come in, you're going to see that they are going to start to increase the temperature because they are uh, breaking down uh, chemicals and they're eating things and they're maintaining their own homeostasis as multicellular organisms. And they are going to increase the temperature of the corpse that they are feeding on by more than 10 degrees Celsius. And we like to use the blowflies because they are first to arrive but we also have studied them a lot and we know their life cycle so we know you know what's gonna go on how, what is there when is it there so day one immediately almost immediately as soon as a corpse dies a uh, person dies and it becomes a corpse um and this goes for any corpse whether it's a, a mouse or a person or a pig whatever it may be those uh flies they pick up on something being dead and they say hey we're gonna leave some eggs here and by the second day, those eggs are going to hatch and you're going to have those larvae that have these hooks in their mouth and those hooks start to tear at the flesh and they're going to start eating it and they're going to continue to grow. And from days three to seven, we're going to see different uh, sized larvae and we actually call these different sizes instars. All right, so we're going to, you know, we're going to see first instar, second instar, third instar, and eventually you're going to get to the pupa, they're gonna the the uh, later instars are going to go down into the soil and they're gonna go pupate. They're gonna make like a little cocoon in the soil and then after they pupate, they are gonna turn into a fly and they are gonna leave and they are going to try to find another corpse to lay eggs and they're gonna start the process all over again. So just by knowing this life cycle, by understanding that the first day there's gonna be eggs there and the second day there's gonna be uh, new instars and then we're going to see the instars grow and then they pupate by the eighth or ninth day and then two weeks later we're going to eventually have these adult flies emerging that can tell us 
when did this person die? How long has this corpse been here? Now, there's different uh, variables that pl come into play, you know, the location, the temperature at that time. So depending on the time of year, that can have an effect on the life cycle of the blowfly. But that's something that an entomologist, and spe more specifically a forensic entomologist, is going to know about. So the blowfly lar larva, um, or the blowfly life cycle, like I said, you're going to have the eggs, and the eggs are going to hatch into first instars, and the first instars are the smallest ones, and they're going to shed their skin when when they, they don't fit that skin anymore, and it's impeding their growth. And then they're going to become second instars, which are medium larvae, and then eventually they're going to shed that and become third instars. And these are our large larvae that eventually are going to stop eating once they get big enough, and they're going to decide, hey, it's time to pupate. They're going to leave that corpse, and they're going to go into the ground where it's a little bit cooler, and they're going to pupate there, and you're going to see that it darkens over time, this cocoon, and then they uh, metamorphose into flies, and the flies emerge, and they, they then they find a new corpse, and they start the cycle all over again. After blowflies feast on the corpse, the cheese skippers and, and other successive fly organisms are right, other organisms that are going to like to feed on a decaying corpse. They come to feed um, much later after the the cheese skippers, you're going to see uh, beetles. Okay, sometimes you see them a little bit earlier if the beetles uh, want to feed on the the flies themselves. But as far as uh, the eating the corpse or or feasting on the tissue, they want the tissue to be dry, which comes much later. So forensic entomologists use these insects and and their predictable life cycles to determine the approximate time intervals between each developmental. Uh, change uh, each stage that they're in and based on the temperature and the moisture conditions of that specific environment. So a uh, forensic entomologist is going to think, is this a desert environment? Is this a wooded environment? Is it very uh, arid? Is it very humid? What is this environment like and how is that going to affect the life cycle of the insects that we find on this corpse? If the entomologist isn't sure of the specific species, they're going to take it back to their lab and they're going to let these uh, insects grow a little bit more so that they can uh, positively ID the exact species of that insect in order to get as much information as they can about the life cycle of that insect and how long does it take for it to uh, for its eggs to hatch and how long is the, the first instar going to the second instar or whatever it may be. So there's different stages of decomposition, and, and you know the forensic investigators are going to look at what stage it's in. And the first stage, you know, we we're, we're living, and then you die, and you're you're immediately going to start decaying, and that is known as initial decay. So immediately after death, the bacteria, which we always have bacteria all over us, you have bacteria on your skin, you have bacteria in your gut. There is bacteria everywhere, and typically we keep them at bay. Some of them we actually want there. Them want, want there. They they help us uh, to uh, synthesize vitamins and and a number of other things. So bacteria are not necessarily a bad thing. We were thinking back about bacteria as being germs or or a bad thing. Some of them are good. Okay, we we just have to keep them at bay and at the proper numbers. But as soon as you die and your your immune system or your lymphatic system is not keeping them at at bay. You're going to see that these bacteria start to expl uh, explode in numbers and population, and they are going to immediately start feasting on our corpse. Okay, enzymes and stomach acid in the body they start to break down the tissue, so you have your bacteria feasting on these. You have the enzymes in the stomach that we usually and the stomach acid that we usually keep at, at bay, starting to break down the tissues, and the blowflies are there, and they're starting to feast on it as well. So immediately we see that. This body starts to decay rather quickly. So as soon as you die, you start decaying. And the initial decay uh, stage typically lasts from as soon as you die up until about three days after death. And this just shows you uh, another example of the, the blowfly life cycle. Have you, you have your uh, eggs, and the eggs are going to become your first instars, and you're going to have your second instars, your third instars, and then they're going to go into the ground to pupate. And then eventually you have these adult blowflies that are going to start the life cycle all over again. Once you've finished that initial 
decay period, you're going to get into the putrefaction stage, right? Putrefaction as the bacteria break down the tissues in the cell, organs are torn open and the fluids leak into the body cavities. The bacteria uses anaerobic respiration. Okay, lack of oxygen there for them. They don't want oxygen. They don't need oxygen because they are going to do just fine without them. And because of this lack of oxygen, they're going to produce various gases such, such as hydrogen sulfide, methane, cadaverine, and putrescine as byproducts. Cadaverine, putrescine, and even really uh, methane, you're going to see, and hydrogen sulfide, all of them are really going to create that terrible smell that we think of as being a putrid smell. So, you know, cadaverine and putrescine, they are going to create that smell that where you think of as, wow, this is rotting organic matter. And then you have hydrogen sulfide and methane, which also don't smell too good. The gases build up and the bacteria rapidly reproduce, with, which causes the body to then bloat. So in the putrefaction stage, we actually see that the body is bloating. And the insect larvae or the maggots, whatever you want to call them, uh, they're going to secre secrete digestive enzymes of their own and use mouth hooks in order to tear through the tissues and break apart the tissues so that they can feed. So not only are they using their math mouth hooks to tear uh, this flesh apart, but they're also uh, putting digestive enzymes of their own on it to further break down this tissue. The foul smell then is going to, we talked about, you know, I'm saying about the cadaverine and the putrescine and the methane. This is all going to attract more insects, okay? More insects are going to say, hey, I smell a de decaying corpse. They're going to come over and you're eventually going to have predators that are going to try to feast on, not necessarily the corpse, but feast on the maggots that are there or the larvae that are there. You have beetles, parasitoid wasps, wasps that want to use those big juicy maggots once they become third instars and they want to actually put eggs into them so that their eggs now have a place to to uh, stay until they hatch and then they'll have something to feed off of. So we have this ecological uh, environment going on where we're looking, we're, we're creating the stability of symbiosis. Um, this stage typically lasts from day four to day 10, but it really depends on the environment. If it's very, very dry uh, area and it's very warm, you're going to see that this stage is going to be pushed back. All right, It might not hit this stage until after 10 days. There's been cases where uh, in the desert, it, it takes very long for it to hit that putrefaction phase because the insects aren't able to thrive as well as they would maybe in, in this area. Then the next stage is black putrefaction. The, the bloated body is actually going to now collapse, okay, You're, which is going to leave this flattened uh, piece of flesh, really, with bones in it, uh, and it has a creamy consistency. Some parts become black, and the smell continues to be very strong, and, you know, that's what we call that putrid smell. That's disgusting. Bacteria continue to play a role in decomposition, so the bacteria is still there, and the insects are still there, and they're breaking it down, and breaking it down, and breaking it down, and, and uh, you know, any insects that were there, I should say any of the blowfly larvae that were there initially, by now they've definitely moved to the soil and have have pupated and we've had generations of flies leave and find new corpses. And the blowflies are less attracted and the predator insects are more attracted to the corpse because there's less for the blowflies to eat as far as what they like to eat is concerned and there's more of what the predatory uh, insects like to eat there. And this stage, typically when we talk about it, lasts from day 10 to day 20. But like I said, it really depends on the environment. Just some examples of predatory beetle. Uh, you have rove beetles that you'll see. Okay, and they're going to be there and they're going to want to uh, feed on some of the insects or the larvae that are there. And then you're going to come to the next phase, which is butyric fermentation, which is much later. It's you know talking about a month in, maybe 20 to from 20 to to 50 days after death is when this is going to occur. And butyric acid causes a cheesy smell, so it's a little bit different than that initial putrid smell. Still a nasty smell. Uh, beetles feed on the skin and the ligaments as it starts to dry out, as everything else is kind of eaten the 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 flesh that's uh, very moist. 
now it's becoming a lot drier in, in, this, in this drier environment that really only has hair and skin and ligaments and bones left. The beetles love it. They're going to come in. They don't want the hair and they don't want the bones, but they're going to strip that bone of any skin and any ligaments that are there. And then cheese skippers are going to feed on any remaining flesh that might be there, even though it's started to dry out and beetles are going to come in. All right, they're still going to want some want whatever flesh is there. And you're going to have parasitic insects that will continue to lay eggs on the corpse that provides food for their larvae. And also uh, the fact that there's other insects there, they can feed on those insects. And, and like I said, it varies on the environment, but typically we talk about it being from 20 days to 50 days after death. Okay, these are what cheese skippers look like. There are different types of cheese skippers, but this is just to get a general idea. It's, you know, when we talk about bugs, we really don't get too specific. Usually when they're flying around a house, we say, oh, it's a fly. Oh, it's a bug. Oh, it's an insect. Oh, get it out of here. But there are different types, obviously. And, you know, this is what a cheese skipper looks like. Obviously, you're not going to be in your house and you're like, oh, that, I think that's a cheese skipper or that, that might be a blowfly. You're going to say it's a fly. Get it out of here. But when we talk about forensic entomology, there are different types of flies and they're going to play different roles and come in at different times. And then you're going to get to the part where you hit dry decay. All right, the corpse is going to dry. It decays very slowly. Eventually, the hair is going to disappear and only bone is left. There are some organisms that do like the hair. So you have mites that are drawn to uh, the bacteria uh, that feed on the hair. So there's bacteria and there's, and there's uh, mites that are going to help break down that hair. And then uh, tineid moths they also feed on the hair and this happens from 50 days all the way up to a year 365 days or it can even go past that depending on the environment but typically now all the flesh is really gone it's just really hair and bone at this point and uh that's when we call it dry decay so it's important to understand the different stages okay and also to understand that there are different insects within these stages